awesome. <laughs> Um, Thanks, John. I, I think I was the one who had to hit record, so my fault. Okay. Uh, yes. So, Hanny, could you um, could you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hanny Mendoza. I'm an environmental science student at Binghamton University, and I will be working with Michael Jersey and our uh, mentor, Dr. Paul um, Laura, in the uh, project modeling the susceptibility of cats to water bodies to invasive plants and animals. Nice to meet you all. All right. And uh, Laura, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Laura Pangolosi. Um, I teach in the geography department at Binghamton. Uh, Hani's a student of mine, and I'm looking forward to the working in the fellowship and, and looking at the locational aspects of invasive species. Uh, Hani is an excellent student. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John? I'm John Thompson. I'm the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership Coordinator at the Catskill Center, and um, I work the Mesa species, so uh, I'm the natural resource manager on those projects. Great. Um, so the next project is understanding the single and combined effects of co-occurring stressors, white-tailed deer, invasive earthworms, and invasive plants. Uh, Marissa, you're up. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Marissa Cordell. Uh, I'm a biology student at SUNY Cortland. Um, Andrea Davalos is uh, my advisor for this project, and yeah, we're going to be investi investigating the co-occurring stressors of white-tailed deer, um, invasive species, and invasive plants on native understory plants um, in the Catskill region. And Andrea? Hey everybody, I'm Andrea Davalos. I am at SUNY Cortland in the Department of Biological Sciences. I normally work with invasive species um, and I will be advising Marisa together with a team from um, several other people, Annis Dobson from Yale University and Timothy McKay from Colgate, as well as Dr. Laura Ironman from SUNY Cortland, who were not able to be here today. Thanks, Andrea. And um... John Thompson is also a resource manager on, on this project. Um, and I don't believe we have any other folks that are on that project here right now. So the next project is an evaluation of stakeholder engagement in the Rondo and Never Sink watersheds. Allison? Hello, I'm Allison Derevensky. I'm a graduate student at Binghamton University studying sustainable communities and public administration, as well as nonprofit administration. And I'm conducting an evaluation of stakeholder engagement and communication methods in the Roundout and Never Sink watershed. And Dr. George Holmesy, who is here today, is my um, mentor on this project. And I'll, I'll be working with Stacy Howell and Mark Vian. Uh, from the Rondat Never Sink Stream Program and the New York City DEP as well. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you, Allison. Thank you. And uh, George. Okay. And so my name is George Holmesy, and I'm a professor, associate professor at Binghamton University. And I'm in the public administration department, and I direct the Sustainable Communities Program and the Environmental Studies Programs uh, at the university. And I'm excited to be working on this project with Allison and with Stacy and with Mark. And Stacy. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Howell, program coordinator for the Rondout Never Sing Stream Program. Um, we are a part of Sullivan County Soil and Water Conservation District and our program um, is funded and works closely with New York City DEP. And we'll be working with Mark Vian um, from DEP also who is not here. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And um, I am going to turn it over to Josh now. Uh, all right, but Jamie, you have to do your introduction. Oh, yes. Um, and my name is uh, Jamie Deppen, and um, I'm coordinator for the Catskill 
Science uh, Collaborative, and um, I'm based at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, and I'm really looking forward to working with you all and seeing all the cool, cool research that you're going to be doing this summer. All right. Um, thank you so much, all. It is a fantastic group of people. Um, so let me give you a very quick thumbnail on who I am. So I'm the president of Cary Institute. Uh, I arrived six, almost seven years ago, September, it'll be seven years, which is insane. I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, I came from the Wildlife Conservation Society at the Bronx Zoo in New York, where I oversaw WCS's global conservation work. Um, and I decided I wanted to go rural, I wanted to go small, and I wanted to go back to science. And uh, for my money, there's no place better than Cary Institute for those three things. Um, we do a lot of work. Uh, all over the world, but we have a footprint in the Catskills and have had for many decades, Kathy Weathers, Gary Lovett, who was the founding director of the CSC um, and others have worked there, particularly on biogeochemistry and, and the relationship between nutrients and forest growth, but also on invasive species, invasive pests and pathogens. I joked with Gary, I grew up uh, spending a lot of time in the Catskills and I have a house near Woodstock where I just had to take down an awful lot of ash uh, because of the various ash diseases that have come in. Uh, and so, you know, the work we're doing there is really important to me personally, but also I think uh, just listening to the introductions made me really proud of the way this works. And I would like to see it not just continue, to, but to grow and to deepen uh, and to be something that we are able to do for years to come, because I think getting a cadre of scientists uh, involved with Catskill research is really important. I serve on the Catskill Advisory Group, uh, which uh, the DEC Commissioner uh, appointed this year to look at particularly overuse uh, or heavy use uh, that occurred uh, in the last decade and, and accelerated in the Catskills as a result of the pandemic and people wanting to go someplace safe outside. Um, and so uh, I can see through that process, there is a tremendous need for information I think DEC and DEP are two remarkable institutions that are science driven, um, but they are always on tight budgets. And I know that uh, the administrator and others are juggling a lot of uh, priorities, um, you know, in public outreach, trails, parking, uh, you know, management, uh, and science. And so anything we can do to help them and, and be part of a process that not just brings this information together, but makes it accessible is really important to me. So, Jamie, uh, do you want to hit the next slide? And yep. See, since I, I don't think I can control your, your deck. Um, so no, I guess that. not. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's give the background. We started three years ago. Um, it's a spinoff from the Catskill Environmental Research and Monitoring Program and is hosted by Cary Institute. I use the word hosted very carefully. Uh, we are an organization that likes to host things but not own them. Uh, for many years now, over a decade, we have hosted the Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network, uh, GLEON, and it's a, now a consortium of over 200 lakes and lake managers around the world, and we don't have a very uh, big thumbprint on that. If you go to the GLEON website, you'll see us mentioned, but, but uh, they won't talk about all the financial things we do in the background, uh, because we really feel that, that collaborations work best when the collaborators own them rather than an institution or an individual. Um, our primary funding is through the EPF, the Environmental Protection Fund, through DEC. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with the EPF, maybe some of the students, uh, it is now a $300 million annual investment from the government of New York in the natural resources of the state. It includes money for research, it includes money to buy land, it includes money to buy easements, uh, it's a very important source of funding for many, many different institutions. And we were incredibly pleased uh, that they were uh, both interested and willing, uh, DEC was and, and, the, and the state legislature was uh, willing to put some money into uh, the Catskills, into science in the Catskills. Uh, we have other funding from the other major partner in the Catskills, the DEP. Um, as somebody who for many years commuted between New York and the Catskills and my house is on a tributary uh, to the Ashokan, so um, I sort of felt like I was at both ends of my drinking water. Um, you know, we can't uh, thank DEP enough for investing in uh, research and in management in the Catskills and in land acquisition and protecting the watershed. Um, and also some funding from Cary Institute. 
Uh, when I got to Cary Institute, we didn't have a big fundraising program. And I've been realizing more and more that we need to amplify and diversify our funding sources. So we are actually trying to raise money from some local foundations and some private individuals to supplement this work so that we can you know, dive a little deeper and do a little better um, and not just rely on DEP and DEC for the funding for this. Uh, we are grateful for that core funding. We couldn't do it without them, but we feel our job is to amplify that. Next slide. All right, what are our goals? Now, collaboration and communication. As I said before, if, if all of you don't own this, um, I think we're failing, right? Uh, we want people who are researchers, and I will use that in two or three different ways. We want natural resource managers, many of whom either started as researchers or uh, have become researchers or would love to be researchers if they only had the time. Um, and we have academics and, and uh, faculty who have done work in the Catskills and are interested in both uh, longer term, more consistent research, but also bringing their students in. And then we have the fellows. And the fellows, you guys, uh, there is a secret uh, underlying theme here, which is we really want you to fall in love with the Catskills. Um, for those of you who don't know the Catskills well, it has been uh, the um, poor stepsister of the Adirondacks. Uh, and Adirondacks have gotten a lot more attention and resources, but the Catskills are closer to both Albany and New York. They're very important resources uh, for water, for, um, for uh, carbon storage, and for other uh, ecological services. Um, and they're a remarkable place. And so we want to make sure we bring attention. So that's the researchers. And for the researchers, now, Jamie, you can pop up. Um, uh, oh, let's start with the publics. We also have a data portal. And the data portal, we have two data interns this summer uh, through Cary Institute. Yeah, I just put it all up. That's fine. Um, and um, the data portal has two real foci, one of which is data. And there are data sets from the Catskills. And, and Jamie's going to be tired of hearing me talk about this particular data set. But a old, old friend of mine worked for Trout Unlimited in the 90s and collected fisheries data on trout and other species in the Catskills. I can't find it. Right? And that is what happens when you don't have a place to store and curate data. So we have a data portal where we'd like to store data sets, both the ones you collect, but also longer term data sets. There's a man named Mike Kudish, who is the forest elf of the Catskills. And Mike has collected data for decades. And we're trying, working with the University of Vermont to get that into the portal and, and then maybe link it to places like NatureServe, uh, which is a program that, that really is uh, excellent at, at collecting and, and, and making accessible point location data across the country for biodiversity. Um, and we also want to start collecting references. So here's a request. As you start getting literature, don't assume we already have it. If you've got a PDF of something or even just a citation, you know, in your report, put the citations in, maybe keep a you know, Excel spreadsheet or a Word document or heaven forbid, a Zotero file. Maybe, Jamie, we could have a communal Zotero file um, and people could put it up on Zotero, which is my new favorite bibliographic manager. But we wanna start what I call scraping for references. Uh, those of you at DEC and DEP will know that one of the challenges is when you do a report, when a, when a follow-up report is done, often that first report just disappears uh, because we have a new version. We don't want people getting confused, excuse me, getting confused. And so capturing information through the data portal, both published and gray literature is really important. The last thing we do on research is we assist the, the biennial CIRM, the uh, Catskill Environmental Research and Monitoring Conference. Jamie helps coordinate that. And uh, it's now going to be triennial. We're pushing it off to next year because we missed, missed it because of the pandemic. Or is that going to be four years, I guess, Jamie? Three and a half. I think three and a half. Yeah, um, which is unfortunate because it's a wonderful place. But when the CIRM meeting happens, all of you should come and present your results because it's a great venue to meet other Catskill researchers but also to talk about research needs. The second thing we're doing, of course, is uh, we don't need to talk about is the Catskill Research Fellowships. And that's the link to natural resource managers. That and the data portal uh, really does that. Um, you know, uh, what we did there, and uh, we'll go back to, uh, I think we have another slide on the, the event, so we won't go backwards. Um, so we, we feel that, you know, in a sense, we'd like to reverse engineer research to ensure that in research that is done by the fellows and their, their mentors and the managers really is valuable and can be applied to management problems. My favorite 
term, as I said, is reverse engineering. And that's saying, okay, we have a problem. We want to know how to solve it. We know what the options are, but we need these data to determine which is the best of the options or to even just define the options outright. So we surveyed resource managers for research needs and we'll continue to do that. We put out a research a request for proposals with these needs and we chose the best proposal. So congratulations on, on being selected. Um, and we try and provide support for the Catskill Research Fellows as well as other research expenses. Um, and as you know, Jamie said it before and we all introduced ourselves, it's a team. Um, and we think that, you know, not just sort of kicking, kicking a, a grad student out into the field or an undergraduate out into the field and saying, okay, go off, do your thing, uh, and leaving you be is a, is a good form of research and, and mentoring. And we find that the mentoring, the co-mentoring with a, a, academic advisors and the natural resource managers ensures that there's a, a touchstone uh, and there's a, a focus on, on doing what we said we were gonna do and what's useful, or even more interesting, when the fellow finds something, and this is really important, uh, you're going out to do a project, but keep your eyes open. You may see things that are different and or interesting or important and bring those back to your mentors and say, you know, I know I'm supposed to be working on invasive, uh, you know, aquatic invasives, but I just, you know, I saw this very strange thing happening with these, these birds eating the aquatic invasives and I'm wondering, you know, are they part of the food chain now, right? So be open-minded, right? Always focus on your work, make sure you're collecting your data, but a good field biologist always is keeping their minds and their eyes open for new opportunities um, and, new, and, and new options. All right, um, what are our goals? You know, as I said, scientifically informed research management. Uh, the managers on this call will uh, probably be able to wax poetic about why science is important, but that there are other factors. And that's why we say informed. Uh, if science drove all management, life in my mind would be somewhat simpler, but of course you've got politics, you've got economics, you've got uh, people who use these resources and, and want access. And, you know, it may be that the science tells us we have several options and the best option may not be tractable. So that's why we say informed resource management. Uh, we want to have a positive research experience for you guys. If you're not having a positive experience, we would much prefer you let us know, call Jamie, let her know that this isn't working or talk to your mentors and say, this isn't working because we want you to have a positive experience. And if it's not positive, let's try and make it that way rather than waiting for the post survey for you to come in and say, oh God, I wish you had done X, Y, and Z. And as I said before, we really wanna build the base of researchers to the cat skills. I am always astonished as a, I like to say a retired field biologist. I spent 25 years doing field work and the Catskills always struck me as a great place to do field work if you're anywhere, you know, in the in the sort of eastern New York area, uh, because you know what better field experience could you have? There are great resources. There's good infrastructure. Eh, the Wi-Fi, well, the cell phone network is lousy, but you know, other than that, um, uh, maybe that'll be a good thing for you guys to get off your phones a bit. Uh, but you know, fundamentally, we would like people to to really see the Catskills as a place to sort of settle in and do more research. Okay, next. All right, we have done introductions so we can uh, jump through this. Thank you, uh, Hanny, Allison, and Marissa. Yes. And then, so I'm going to. Um, so that's, this is where we stop and do. Yep, yeah, this is where we're going to stop. Okay, uh, and, so that's it. Thank you. Sorry if I rab rabbited on too long. Oh, that's, we're, we are good. Um, so I'm, I am going to stop sharing and uh, then. I'll just stop oh. sharing. Uh, I just want to mention there was the third leg of the of the stool that I forgot to mention, which is we do uh, outreach events for the general public, um, and we are increasingly coordinating with groups like Catskill Mountain Keeper, Catskill Center. I would love to work with Woodstock Land Conservancy, Beaverkill Land Conservancy, and others, because guess what? They have uh, embedded uh, audiences whom we can tap into who are already interested in learning more about natural resources in the Catskills. So I did a, a talk with the Mountain Keeper uh, last Monday. They, they organized that on uh, ticks and Lyme disease where Jamie and I are looking at one on, on uh, well, everyone else's favorite thing, which is uh, poison ivy. Um, and so if you guys, again, have ideas for uh, outreach uh, or at the end of your study, we could do something with you, uh, that'd be great. All right, sorry, Jamie, I wanna make sure I didn't forget that. No problem, thanks, thanks so much, Josh. Um... Okay, so Allison, I believe you were, yep, 
you are next. And get out of this. Um, you're muted. I'm mute. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And everybody can see my screen. Yes, yes that looks great. great. Okay, hello. Um, again, I'm Allison Derevinsky. I'm a researcher from Binghamton University, I'm a fellow, and I'm working with Dr. George Holmesy, who's here today, as well as Stacey Howell and Mark Byan on an evaluation of environmental communication methods and stakeholder engagement in the Rondout and Never Sink watershed. So my research questions are based on the idea that the Roundout and Never Sink Stream Program are releasing uh, updated stream management plans in 2021 and 2022. And they are wondering how to best share that information with the watershed community. And they want to know more information from the community on how to engage uh, their stakeholders. So my questions are, what are the current methods of sharing environmental information? Uh, how might communication methods need to change to reach different demographic groups in the area? And what are the best methods to increase stakeholder engagement in the stream management planning process? My activities to uh, attempt to answer these questions are to complete a demographic analysis of the Ronda and Neversink watershed to measure recent changes. I've already started this process uh, using Social Explorer and census data um, but I'll take a deeper dive into that information um, in the coming months. Uh, I will analyze community participation data of past events. So things like email clicks, social media engagement, uh, event attendance, um, things like that, including online events uh, because of the pandemic. I'm, I'm also interested to see how those turned out as well. Um, I will also conduct an experiment to test participation rates for different communication methods. So testing the effectiveness of email, uh, in-person events, social media, um, all these different things to gauge what people are responding to in the community. And I'm also going to survey stakeholders to see how much they know about the current stream management plans and what they expect to see in updated plans. So. Um, the events that were just mentioned before might be really helpful for this project, actually, um, those public engagement events. My timeline is uh, as follows. So April to May, I've just been doing the preliminary literature review um, through one of my classes, and I will continue to do that um, throughout this month, as the, the end of this month and early June as well. Uh, June to August, research and data collection and analysis. September to November is data analysis and report writing. December is the final report writing and editing. And I should have my final report and presentation by the end of that month. And how does this relate to natural resource management? So through my initial research that I've done so far, I found that effective communication methods are really important for building trust in local communities because this fosters growth in stakeholder engagement in the management planning process. Um, I have talked to a few folks in the Catskills um, through my bungalow colony and you know they've seen that there's a lot of tension between um, regulatory organizations and the DEP and um, local community members who are trying to just understand more about their environment and, um, you know, how all these different stakeholders play a role in their lives. Um, so this is really important for building trust and getting more information from community members. Um, these effective communication me uh, methods also help us learn more about local issues and values within uh, communities. So there can be really niche, um, you know, values or or environmental issues that are 
only affecting one landowner or one part of a stream. And we might overlook that if we're not communicating actively with different people in the community. And also natural resource management plans need community support to be successful because if you don't have community support, it's really hard to get funding. It's really hard to um, just move any plans forward. And that's my presentation, my references and questions. And I can stop sharing so we can see everybody. Thank you, Allison. You are going to be busy this summer. <laughs> um, so, and what have so you said that you had already you've already started talking to folks, but it was it's in your uh, within your bungalow colony. It was just very casual conversation, okay. nothing like research uh, related. Um, okay. But there's actually somebody who works in the Catskill bungalow area. He does like construction, and and he's been there for a very long time, and he lives on a stream. Um, so he was just talking about how the different programs have affected him, and over time, it was very interesting. interesting. <laughs> Um, and are you, is, is your work going to be more remote or will you be um, going like to any events or meetings or anything? If there are events in the Catskills in the um, two towns, uh, the Round Out Never Sink Stream program specifically caters to Never Sink and Denning. So if there are things there, I will try and show up, but most of it will be remote depending on COVID stuff so okay great well thank you if there's no other questions thanks allison um let's move on to hanny can you share your screen hanny yes share okay so hi everyone again my name is hanny mendoza um we are gonna be working in the um, Catskill Park Invasive Species topic and our project is called Modeling the Susceptibility of Catskill Water Bodies to Invasive, invasive Plants and Animals. Our group is formed by um, Michael Jersey from the Geography Department, uh, Dr. Laura from the Geography Department as well, and me from uh, the Environmental Studies Program. Okay, so what are our questions to answer in this study? So first of all, what is our area of study? Um, in this map, our GIS map, you can see here, um, our area of study was supposed to be originally only the Cascade Park, but um, we could see that the prevalence of invasive species what not, was not as strong as in surrounding areas. Um, this might be because the Catskill uh, Park is a managed water body, but we're not sure about that. Uh, but we decided it was uh, viable to expand our limits a little bit. So uh, we expanded until the um, this part delineated in black over here, which is the CRISP area, uh, which CRISP uh, stands for Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership. Um, in this map, the black icons represent in, uh, aquatic invasive species and the purple or pink ones represent the semi-aquatic ones. Um, where are the risks of invasive species in the Cascade region? Well, the areas of, the, uh, of this region that have high risks of invasive species are mostly the ones that are very frequented by people because um, as we know, people may carry invasive species in their boats, in their equipment, um, and they may not know it, but they are carrying invasive species from one place to another. Um, we are gonna be using as a guide, the study of Shaker et al, uh, which um, talks about, um, how in the Adirondack lakes uh, invasive species have posed problems to um, humans and um, endemic species as well. Uh, so as, I don't remember who was it, I think it was um, Joshua who was talking about how everyone uh, worries more about the Adirondack. So we decided to use this study as a, as a guide to have something similar done in the Catskill Mountains. Um, and um, as I said, human presence influenced a lot um, the, the, um, the presence as well of invasive species. 
What is the dependent study of our independent variable of a study? Um, it's going to be the location of invasive species. And the independent variable is going to be what influences the location of invasive species. So it's going to be there are going to be factors uh, naturally occurring or anthropogenic, such as small craft usage, lake elevation, lake location, water turbidity, and stuff like this that is going to be influencing um, the location of invasive species. And this is going to be our um, independent variable. Now, um, what activities will we be doing and what is the timeline for them? OK, so for activities, uh, First of all, we're going to be doing secondary data analysis and secondary da data, which means is that it's data that has been uh, public made public available, but we did not collect it. So we are just going to be analyzing it. Um, we are also going to be doing hotspot analysis in GIS, and we're going to be using some type of regression analysis. Um, regression analysis is a re reliable statistical method of identifying which variables are important for our topic of study, which is the um, invasive species in the Catskills. Uh, and this will allow us to determine which factors matter the most, which factors should we um, ignore, and how these factors influence each other. Uh, and for the timeline, um, we have right now the, collect, the data collection is underway. Um, the draft of the project um, will be done by late August. The presentation of results will be in October of this year. And uh, we anticipate that the project report is going to be done by December the 31st. Now, uh, why is this important um, for natural resource management? Um, there's a couple of things that, um, for example, problems that invasive species can cause to endemic species, humans, and also water bodies. Um, we're gonna talk uh, about how invasive species can affect endemic species. Um, and as an example, um, we have many cases, but I'm just gonna give one example. And it's the hydrilla and bald eagles as an example. Uh, we are referring to a study by Brangling there at all, uh, in which he talks about um, a disease called vacular myelinopathy, uh, which is a neurological disease characterized by widespread vacualization in the white matter of the brain. Um, this disease was diagnosed in 1994 in bald eagles, and it has since spread throughout the southeastern United States. Um, but why is this disease uh, relevant for the study? Well, it's relevant because its occurrence has been linked to a cyanobacterium um, that grows on an aquatic invasive species of plant, which is Hydrilla verticillata. Um, and it's mostly found in man-made water bodies. Um, this disease, the way it is transferred is not contagious, but when herbiv herbivorous animals eat the plant, Hydrilla, uh, that is colonized with this cyanobacterium, they acquire the disease um, and um, they transfer this disease up the food chain. So basically, if bald eagles were to eat one of the fishes that is um, infected with the disease, he's going to get it as well. So basically, we have amphibians, some reptiles, um, fishes, and other waterfowl that is infected with this disease just by eating hydrilla. Um, now, what problems can invasive species cause to humans? Um, we have that invasive species plants can cause more organic matter to grow on the surface of the water, uh, which leads to decreased in uh, light penetration and also they intervene in water treatment process. The way they intervene in the water uh, treatment process is that a mixture of organic matter, when it's mixed with chlorine um, in drinking water treatment facilities, this can create disinfection byproducts that can be carcinogens. So, um, this invasive species of plant that grow underwater also uh, pose a problem for drinking water because we know that um, Catskill water bodies are um, the main source of drinking water for places like New York City and surrounding areas. Um, and then the placements of stu stewards to prevent invasive species spread via boating. Uh, so. Um, the major preventing effort in New York State right now uh, for aquatic, aquatic invasive species is the CRISP Watershed Steward Program, uh, in which they train stewards to prevent invasive species by informing the, the public in selected sites. Um, 
and um, by the end of our project, we will be able to make suggestions to this program about where they should place their, the stewards so we can prevent uh, invasive species to keep propagating from one watershed to another. Um, this is basically what where we've gotten so far, and um, I hope that you found this um, presentation um, useful. Thank you. Thank you, Hanny. Um, do we have any questions for Hanny? All right. I was talking that. Oh, go ahead, John. Uh, well, I was just wondering: are are there any besides the the watershed stewards? Uh, they're collecting data on the number of people that they speak to and the uses of of the launches that they're at. Is there other data that uh, you found or that you know about or you think that you'll be able to track down about uh, the use of water bodies um, that has anyone estimated or counted the use of water bodies uh, at other boat launches besides the ones that we have watershed stewards at? So our data collection is underway. So we're hoping. So I don't know if Professor Laura um, has anything else to say about it. But yeah, our, we're collating the data right now. But we are hoping to like go beyond that. That would be really helpful for mm -hmm. the invasive species situation. Yes, we would be. We need to find the data. It's a very noisy place right now. But, but any uh, data like that, uh, we would be very eager to get. Yeah, I don't know if if DEC has collected data at other places. Maybe uh, along the Delaware, the National Park Service. Um, but. Yeah, I hope that there's other data out there, or at least estimates that people have made about use of, of areas. Okay. Great. I'm not sure if Allison has yeah, a question. I was just wondering on that point, if the Catskill Center or other places that deal with um, recreational use of the Catskills might have data on boat launch popularity or like which, which boat launches are the most used if, or if they even track data on uh, like usage of the, of the water bodies. Um, Cause I'm thinking maybe like the Basha Kill uh, sites like that, that have very popular boat launches might have data on how many people go out, uh, you know, in a season or something like that. I don't know, maybe you'll find it, maybe you'll, <laughs> we'll see. You know, the, the Hudson Watershed Alliance would be another place to sort of go to get ideas because they, you know, being a membership organization of all those different uh, watershed organizations and, uh, you know, Stacey, you can probably comment more uh, accurately on that, but, but they may have um, ideas about how to tap into that network. And I think the Watershed Alliance is, and for those that have, uh, you know, feed into reservoirs, DEP are, are likely to be the best sources for that kind of data. Okay, we, we are willing to um, collect all the kind of data that um, is available to us. The good thing is that um, we're going to be analyzing secondary data, so um, we just have to get permission to use it and then um, go from there. It, yeah, and I, I guess I could add, and you're probably aware of this, but the, the DEP has a permitting system on their reservoirs, so, um, and, and they have a the, the boats need to be steam cleaned and things like that, but um, they do have use numbers if it's useful for your project. Yes, thank you. I'm taking notes. <laughs> right, thank you, Hanny. Um, Marissa, could your next step? Yeah, okay. I will share my screen. Uh, Okay, so again, um, I am Marissa Cordell. Um, I'm an undergraduate at SUNY Cortland. Um, and my project this summer is going to be investigating the single and combined effects of co-occurring stressors 
of white-tailed deer, invasive earthworms, and invasive plants on native understory plants. And so to start a little bit of background, um, invasive plants are a high priority for managers and invasive plant removal is generally the management option that is chosen to deal with these um, invasive plants. Um, they can have many effects on the forest. They can change the um, composition and the structure of the forest by competition for resources and space with the native plants, um, specifically um, Microstegium feminium, um, also known as stilt grass, um, is an invasive C4 grass um, that has become widespread in northeastern forests. Um, Microstegium is known to uh, displace native plants um, as well as displace uh, brown nesting birds um, from their native habitat. Um, earthworms are also invasive to um, northeastern forests um, and can have many negative impacts on the uh, forests. Um, they can affect um, nutrient dynamics within the soil. They can affect water percolation throughout the soil and as well um, even change the soil structure. Um, specifically, jumping worms are uh, earthworms that have been introduced um, from Asia and are in the uh, ferritinoid clade. Um, there are three species of jumping worms that are widely distributed throughout forests um, in the mid-Atlantic region and in New York State. Um, and if you look down here at the picture that I have on the bottom, um, this is an area where jumping worms are present. And the picture on the left was taken in June of 2016. And the picture on the right was taken in August of 2016. And so you can really see um, just how much um, the presence of earthworm, these jumping worms can change. Um, the soil and the leaf litter um, on the forest floor. And so um, white-tailed deer, um, while not invasive, um, their populations have been expanding um, due to decreased um, predation pressures as well as increased um, agricultural land usage. Um, they graze on understory plants um, but tend to avoid uh, non-native species um, and this uh, deer browsing um, has been seen to have a positive effect on non-native plant species in the forest um, in Mycostegium. And so this summer, um, our objective is to, obsess, uh, is to assess the single and combined threats of white-tailed deer, jumping worms, and Mycostegium on native understory plants. Um, in addition, um, we hope that our research can raise awareness about um, invasive earthworms to local managers and communities. And so our hypothesis um, going into the summer is um, that the stressors of microstegium, deer browsing, and jumping worms um, individually um, can all decrease um, native plant performance. However, in combination, um, all of these um, stressors will um, have a greater decrease in performance of the native plants. And specifically, we're hypothesizing that deer browsing and jumping worm abundance are really the drivers of this um, decrease in performance. And so how we're going to do this, um, we have actually already identified um, six different sites um, throughout the Catskill region um, where we'll be conducting this experiment. Um, we have the Seaslaw site up here um, where we have two sites um, identified. Um, we have the DEP sites um, down here where we have three sites identified and the visitor center with one site identified um, to use. Um, in addition, we also have over here a private property, the Miller property um, as a backup site. And each of these sites have varying amounts of jumping worm abundance and microstegium at the sites. At each site, um, we have, we're gonna have two different plots. Um, one plot will be a closed um, fence plot um, here on the left where um, the, there will be deer exclusion fences. Um, and so no deer browsing will be happening. On the right, we see um, open plots where there is no fencing. And so deer browsing will be occurring in these plots. Um, and we will uh, measure the jumping worm abundance and percent cover um, in each plot, as well as we will be transplanting and uh, 20 seedlings of red oak and 20 seedlings of zigzag goldenrod um, into each plot as they are native species um, in the Catskill region. And so 
again, we're going to be using the zigzag goldenrod and red oak. Um, here in the middle, we have a picture of the deer exclusion fences that are already present. And uh, the picture on the right is an example of the mustard sampling that we'll be, we will be doing to sample for the earthworms. Um, the mustard sampling works by irritating the skin of the earthworms, um, causing them to um, come up to the surface of the soil for easy collection and um, sampling. And so in addition to this um, uh, measurement of microstegium and jumping worm abundance, um, we will also be installing lysimeters into the soil, which helps us um, collect data about water and nutrients um, within the soil. We'll also be taking um, some soil cores so that we can um, collect data on the characteristics of the soil, such as the pH and um, texture of the soil. And we will also be doing um, collecting DNA from the earthworms that we collect and um, identifying the species of the earthworms at each site. And then at the end of the summer, um, we will uh, perform analysis on all of this data that we've collected throughout the summer. Um, and hopefully by um, this uh, analysis and interpretation will be done by October for um, a presentation that I will have prepared for then. And so some outcomes that we're hoping for from this project is that we want to um, be able to contribute to the broader knowledge of how multiple stressors can interact and alter community composition. Um, we hope that our findings can help stakeholders develop more efficient and more cost effective um, management plans that can help them succeed in reaching their goals. And we hope that um, our project can help bring awareness of the growing threat of jumping worms to local managers and communities throughout the Catskill region. Um, and with that, um, are there any questions? Thank you, Marissa. Do um, we have any questions? I have, a, I have a very basic non worm question, non worm studying person question. Do these worms really jump? Yeah, they actually, I mean, if you've seen like night crawlers before, they don't really move very much. Um, the jumping worms, if you like touch them and stuff, they move like quite a lot more and are more reactive than earthworms. Okay, but then, yeah. they're not like jumping up. No, no, they don't like jump into the air, but. <laughs> These are all very interesting. I'm, you know, I'm kind of jealous of uh, Jamie and Josh who get to see all these things come across their desks and work on them. Yeah, it's, it's George, the best part of having become a senior manager is uh, I get to see everything. The worst part is I don't get to do any of it. <laughs> so there are trade-offs, um, but no, I agree. All the projects sound great. I, I, I really love that we've got a little social, a little ecological, we've got, water, we've got land, we've got invasives in two different flavors. Uh, there are common themes between and amongst, uh, but it's a nice diverse group of projects. And, and I really think you guys are, are, are gonna come up with some really interesting answers. On this last one, Marissa, I'm really curious, how much, do, how much do you have to plant of the natives, even goldenrod, which is pretty invasive, even though it's a native, um, how much do you have to plant to, do you think to supplant the invasives, the, the exotics? Um, I am not sure, but I think that that will be, you know, answered throughout this um, summer project. Um, you know, we, we know how much we're planting of each into the, um, each plot and how much microstegium is going to be there. So right. it's definitely so, um, something that we can yeah. look into. So, because, I mean, one of the, the, you know, all of you who have worked on invasive species know that if you don't get the genie back in the bottle very quickly, then it is a question of management, not eradication, right? And, and if you have better management strategies that can help, I mean, so we're, we're doing A, we're doing one part of it, which says, let's keep the genie in the bottle by ensuring that, that it doesn't move between and among water bodies. But then B, on the, on the planting out, I think it's great because if that works over the longer period of time, it's a much better strategy than trying to kill it, right? 
um, using ecology to sort of tip the balance. And, you know, as, as invasives come into equilibrium, which they almost always do, um, that process may actually become more powerful. So I really am excited, right? Um, I thank you, George. I, I do love this. You see that you see that, but I'm excited that you are uh, doing such interesting work. I only wish we had more money, more people, and more time.